Good morning, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Tamadar Al Shamlan, and I am from the first graduating class of arts history in VCU Qatar. It is a great honor and privilege for me to be part of this remarkable initiative that celebrates Islamic art and culture globally. Dr. Linda Komarov, who I am honored to introduce, is a well-known figure in the field of academia and art. Dr. Komarov received her PhD from the Institute of Fine Arts, New York University, specializing in Islamic art from Iran. Dr. Komarov is the curator of Islamic art and head of the the Art of the Middle East Department at the Los Angeles County Museum since 1995. She has, during those years, she has expanded the Islamic collection to include art of the contemporary Middle East and North Africa. Her latest contemporary exhibitions include Islamic Art Now, Contemporary Art of the Middle East, Part 1 and Part 2, and Abdel Nasser Karim Pause, which was showcased in 2017. Her next contemporary exhibition titled In the Field of Contemporary, uh, in, the f titled, uh, in the Field of Empty Days, the Intersections of Past and Present in Iranian Art is scheduled for 2018. Dr. Komarov is also the author and editor of several books such as Islamic Art Now, Contemporary Art of the Middle East, Islamic Art in the Metropolitan Museum, The Historical Context, and the Golden Disk of Heaven. The, the Golden Disk of Heaven, Metalwork of the Timurid, Iran. Today she will be presenting a paper titled Islamic Art, uh, Past, Present, and Future. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Linda Komarov. Anyway, so that, that's the actual title. Good morning. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Okay, since I can't see the audience anyway, at least I can see my text. So um, I'd first like to take this opportunity to thank the sponsors, VCU Arts in Richmond and Qatar and the Qatar Foundation for organizing the conference and for the wonderful hospitality. Sorry, I was complaining about so much fish to eat. Um, I'd especially like to thank my, my good friends Sheila Blair and Jonathan Bloom for thinking to include me among this eminent assemblage of scholars and artists. So to begin, I used to believe that there was no connection between the contemporary art world and Islamic art. In graduate school, I was taught that there was no fixed date for the beginnings of Islamic art, sometime during the first century of the Islamic era. But there was an end date around the mid-19th century when art of the Middle East was either overwhelmed by the influence of Western art or reduced to crafts-like reproductions of earlier classical work. I do not know why it took so long for me to question this idea of an end date, but have lately come to take a longer view of history, and one that may ask more questions than it answers. My awakening to the notion that the parameters of Islamic art could be expanded to embrace contemporary art from the Middle East is therefore comparatively recent. In order to reconcile this with the fact that over the last decade or so, I've helped to form a collection of contemporary Middle East art at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art that now numbers well over 300 works, therefore requires a little bit of explaining. I remember very clearly my first encounter with contemporary Middle East art at LACMA, or Los Angeles County Museum of Art. It was the late 1990s, not long after I had moved to Los Angeles, and one of my curatorial colleagues called to ask if I could provide some insight into this work, Mona Khatoum's now iconic 1995 prayer mat. My colleague, who was in a rush to write a curatorial justification to bring it into the collection as a gift, had no image to show me, so she described to work, the work to me. My, and it was a good description. My first response was to inquire naively, why not ask the artist about her intention? The unsatisfying reply that the artist lived in London left me no choice but to attempt to assist. So I explained the significance of the embedded compass directing the supplicant, supplicant toward Mecca and spoke about the act of prayer and its associated postures and casually observed that a prayer mat made of rows of sharply pointed pins, as here, would be very uncomfortable. Many months later, I chanced upon the Hatum piece on exhibition accompanied by a label that repeated verbatim my very literal, literal interpretation and nonchalant remarks. 
It was only much later that I came to appreciate Khatoum's uh, remarkable transformation of a symbol of comfort and spirituality into something tortuous to express the complex feelings of exile and displacement, which especially characterizes her early works. And how expected then that I would include this work in the 2015 installation of contemporary Middle East art at LACMA, alone from our contemporary art department. And um, just in fairness, Wafa Bilal's photograph is in the background because he's here uh, from his Ashes series. When I arrived at LACMA tw about tw a little over 20 years ago, it was expressly to be the curator in charge of the Islamic art collection which over the years I've had the fortunate opportunity to reshape and expand through various acquisitions. So that it is now about twice the size it was and is a far more com comprehensive in collection. Even including now an 18th century Damascus room of which I'm inordinately proud. But this is not what propelled me over the contemporary threshold. My epiphany, and it truly was an epiphany, came as a direct result of an exhibition I saw at the British Museum in 2006, Word into Art, organized my, by my friend and colleague in Islamic art, Venetia Porter, who I know I'm, I'm embarrassing now. This landmark exhibition focused on calligraphy and demonstrated how artists today use this classic Islamic art form, but in a contemporary manner and often in materials other than ink and paper. I was startled by the revelation that the art that fascinated me was not, in fact, dead but lived on in a sense, sharing the same DNA with historical Islamic art. For instance, the use of writing in the Arabic alphabet as a means of communication and decoration. But there's more. I visited Word Into Art five times over the course of two weeks, and what also struck me was the deep engagement of museum visitors. They were looking and talking to one another and talking and looking again. For a curator, there is no greater sign than this of having gotten it right. For most curators, it is not merely about building the best or largest or most comprehensive collection, but rather it is creating an installation or exhibition that resonates and connects with the audience. When it comes to Middle East art, this has an even greater significance and in recent years a greater urgency. My own curatorial mission has been fueled not only by academic and practical experience, but by a long time internal dialogue that seeks some reconciliation and equilibrium between what I do professionally, which, which in some, is something that engages me very deeply and on a variety of levels, and the realities, often bleak, of the world we inhabit. To some extent, it is something I think about every day, and my ideas have evolved considerably over the years. I am constantly aware of the fact that it is often my own curatorial lens that frames the gaze of our visitors, and in post-9-11 America, I feel as though I have to get it just right. Sorry. And so, in 2006, with the blessing of LACMA's director, Michael Govan, but without a budget, I, I began to acquire contemporary art from my department. I was given this expanded portfolio to provide a modern day face to our Islamic art collection, demonstrating the deep connection between past and present, which is at the heart of an encyclopedic art museum. But of equal concern, and quite apart from our historical collection, is how the works signal the virtuosity and creativity of artists from the Middle East and diaspora communities. From what I saw at the British Museum and then later on at LACMA, this type of art excites visitors, in part perhaps because though readily recognizable as contemporary, it also looks quite different. And sadly but importantly, it engages an audience because it is unexpected nowadays. The Middle East has become best known for things other than the contemplative beauty of art, unfortunately. It seems to me that the ability to appreciate the inherent and perhaps at times, quote, extravagant beauty of Islamic art, as the art critic Hilton Kramer once characterized it, is what unites us uh, as humans, past and present, east and west, east side, west side, all around the town. But is it enough? With contemporary art, the connection is more immediate, 
the place names more relevant. And ultimately, I hope, the dismal reports and, uh, and blur of media images may somehow become more human. Among the first artists I brought into the collection was the Iranian photographer Shadi Ghadarian. These intriguingly anachronistic images from a series of 33 photographs, all at LACMA, and inspired by, are all at LACMA, and are, were inspired by the studio portraiture first introduced to Iran in the late 19th century under the Qajar dynasty. In order to recreate the earlier setting, Ghadarian employed painted backdrops and dressed her models in vintage clothes to emulate the fashions of the day. She added modern elements to these traditional scenes, such as the Pepsi can, which you can see here. These are enormously appealing images, in part because it is easy to appreciate the artist's intent, of which she has said, quote, my pictures became a mirror reflecting how I feel, how I felt. We are stuck between tradition and modernity. Initially, my acquisitions were mainly restricted to photography and other print media. In addition to integrating contemporary works within the historical collection, I took over an unused space, basically an elevator lobby adjacent to the Islamic art galleries, where I began to have small dedicated installations. When no one objected to my co-opting this space, I had the walls recovered with drywall to make the space more versatile, as in this small installation of Nusha Tavakolian's photographs. By this time, 2014, my range of acquisitions had expanded to include video, soon followed by neon and three-dimensional works. Here, for example, Hassan Hajjaj's My Rock Stars 2012, a three-channel video projecting nine separately filmed performances by an international array of musicians, the artist's own rock stars. As each performs, the others become the audience, projected life-size, the video was installed opposite a bank of three elevators, and it was enormously pleasurable watching the faces of visitors, generally wonderment and happy surprise as the elevator doors opened onto the performance. As visitors turned the corner to enter the Islamic art galleries at, and view the collections, collection, it seemed to me they had a different level of expectation and engagement. Whatever it was that first drew me to study Islamic art, possibly the unique combination of color and design, the oscillation between abstraction and figuration, and especially the inclusion of text in the Arabic alphabet, is also what attracts me to Hassan's work, of which we have four in the collection, including these three photographs. It seems to me that if music videos had existed in the medieval Islamic world, this is how they would have looked and sounded. In 2012, with a large part of our Islamic art collection on tour in Latin America, we were able to redo the galleries and install the first of a two-part exhibition devoted to the contemporary collection. Here you can see with Lala Saidi's Odalisque in the front. And then this is the second part from 2016. Like the first, it included dedicated spaces for video. Here, a single channel video from the series Rustam in Wonderland, and as many of you know, Rustam is the great hero of the Shahnameh, the Iranian national epic. Inspired by the famous text, many contemporary artists elect to bypass its universalities in favor of more specific social commentary, as in this animation, in which Rustam is transplanted to the 21st century, where he struggles with the sometimes farcical and often extreme contradictions of everyday life in Iran. The last installation uh, in these galleries was actually a small loan exhibition, uh, the work of the Saudi Arabian artist Abdul Nasser Haram, including two works from our collection. I'm just showing you, we, we don't normally have billboards, but I thought this was kind of cool. Although the media and platforms for his work clearly borrow from the mainstreams of modern art, the narratives and images are drawn from his everyday world in Saudi Arabia while many of his motifs, including geometric designs, floral arabesques, and especially architectural elements, belong to the canon of Islamic art. These are powerful and provocative works that only gradually reveal their meanings. Once this exhibition closed last summer, so did my galleries, and for good, soon to be followed by the entire building and then nearly all buildings at LACMA in pre preparation for a new building. 
but I still have a large exhibition plan for this coming spring elsewhere on campus entitled In the Fields of Empty Days, the Intersection of Past and Present in Iranian Art, it now combines my interests in historical and contemporary art, and you're looking at the catalog cover. The theme is the continuous and inescapable presence of the past in Iranian society as revealed in art and literature, in which long ago kings and heroes are used in subsequent contexts as paradigms of grandeur and virtue, or as objects of derision and malevolence while long gone Shia saints and martyrs are evoked as champions of the poor and the oppressed. Both of these strands, ancient kings and heroes and martyred Shiite imams carry forward, even sometimes overlapping in contemporary art. While the past once was visualized in terms of the present, by the second half of the 20th century, the present began to, re be, rem be, the present began to be rendered anachronistically as a form of often barely disguised political and social commentary. In the Fields of Empty Days, we'll cover a wide swath of Iranian art, including Safavid manuscript illustrations, as well as Gajar era photographs and other works, but it concentrates on the art from the final years of the reign of Muhammad Reza Shah in the 1970s through the Islamic Revela Revolution of 1979 and up to the present day. Nearly half of the works in the exhibition are drawn from Lachmas collection, many of them acquired over the past few years, few years specifically for this purpose as here. My twin goal in terms of the exhibition and the collection is to portray ideas of identity, politics, faith, history, and culture that help that helped to define the remarkably diverse artistic heritage of Iran as viewed through the lens of time. As noted, much of LACMA will close to make way for a new building, which gives me several years to dream about and plan for a new, larger gallery where I can choose to integrate the historical and contemporary collections or exhibit them separately. In the remaining time, I would like to give an expanded idea of works in the contemporary collection and how, to my mind, they relate or fit comfortably alongside the historical collection, an admittedly complex juxtaposition between present and past. This photograph is among the most powerful and appealing images from Shirin Nashat's monumental 1996 series, Women of Allah which portrayed chador-clad Iranian women often posed with rifle or gun in a provocative manner, whose exposed body parts are inscribed with text in black ink. Here the print shows the side of a woman's face, the barrel of a gun emerging from the shadowy area between her cheek and barely visible chador like a, go like a gaudy earring. She stares outward calmly, her face covered with verses by the Iranian poet Tahira Safarzadeh, in which she addresses her brothers in the revolution, asking if she can participate. While this print has a specific contemporary context, the use of inscriptions which relate to or enhance the inherent meaning of the work has a long history in Islamic art of Iran. As here, the tinned copper bowl speaking in the voice of the artist, references its decoration and form in Persian verses. The ceramic ewer invites us in Arabic, shab fiha, drink from it. And the cut and pasted Persian verses surrounding the prisoner speak of unrequited, the painting of the prisoner, I should say, speak of unrequited love, and placed in the lower, lower right corner beneath the bent leg of the captive, almost like a caption, the words, quote, happy is the prisoner who, is so, who has someone to come to his aid, end quote, suggests this is no ordinary prisoner, but a prisoner of love. These are stills from Mona Khatum's 1988 video, Measures of Distance, which is how I truly came to discover this artist about 10 years ago. Again, writing in Arabic explicates the imagery. The artist's mother in the shower is covered only by the text of her letters to her daughter, which are read aloud in English. Um, this is a multi-dimensional piece, but it's also a highly personal and emotional work, to which I'll return later. Culled from a Saudi Arabian newspaper clipping, this disassembled image by Manal Duyan depicts fully veiled women clothed in a traditional black abaya engaged in study. Each section of the photograph is inscribed with an arch archaic Arabic word rendered in black plexiglass. All are synonyms for the word courage and appropriated from a, um, 
a 10th century text, which contains detailed categorizations of thousands of now anachronistic Arabic words. The, te the connection between text and image is more subtle in Ahmed Matar's illumination diptych, although its relationship to the Islamic arts of the book, most notably manuscripts of the Quran, is obvious. Generally a small scale and intimate art form, Matar has radically expanded the scale of his illuminations, creating instead a different sense of intimacy by using his pages to, to frame or incorporate a human x-ray. For what could be more intimate and personal than literally to see inside another person? The skeletal images suggest some elemental form of humanity, stripped of the skin, hair, eyes, and clothes that differentiate as well as separate us. Calligraphy, of course, remains an art form that can be practiced outside the context of a manuscript, as in monumental inscriptions or smaller scale works that can be framed and hung on the wall. Here are works by Saudi artists Luwa al Hamoud and Nasr al Salam, both of whom study traditional calligraphy as well as the history of the theoretical and proportional systems on which this art is based. Each has moved beyond to create a dynamic contemporary art form. As Salem has developed a unique approach to writing, for example, the three-dimensional calligraphy rendered in square Kufic script, where he cleverly transor transforms the namesake Quranic verse, whoever obeys Allah, he will make for him a way out into a maze. The calligraphic composition not only renders the words of the verse, but visually recreates its meaning. In the infinity box, he uses neon to render the word Allah, which through the use of mirrors creates an optical illusion, visually substantiating the belief in the infinite nature of God. Once one of Turkey's best known contemporary artists, Borhan Doanje, was inspired by calligraphy in this beautiful pair of abstract compositions from the 1980s, in which the bright, intensely curvilinear forms seemed to burst forth from the flat, solid colored backgrounds. This calligraphic sculpture from Iran, meant to be suspended from the ceiling, takes the form of the colloquial Persian expression sepalashk, which is roughly equivalent to the popular, or I guess it's still popular, American phrase, no way. This saying may have originated among gamblers unsuccessful at throwing dice, indicating that it once had a somewhat coarser meaning. Sepalashk is one of a series of commonplace expressions, tongue twisters, nursery rhymes, and slogans that Iman, Iman Safai has used in his calligraphic work, sorry, calligraphic work rendered in iron, brass, and neon, both small and large scale. These works speak to the ubiquity of writing in modern day Iranian society as a means of both artistic expression and communication, regardless of the significance of the message. This open work text also relates it to earlier Iranian art in Lakma's historical collections, such as this early 17th century alam or standard. Moving away from calligraphy and toward abstraction and figuration, also key features of Islamic art, we have Susan Hafuna's Woman Behind Mashrabiya. Here, largely obscured by the deeply cast shadows of the intricately carved mashrabiya or window screen, we see barely, a woman in full hijab. The tensely structured tectonics of light and shadow give this photograph its strength, but it is the image's beguiling ambiguity and our own complex reactions to it that make it an exceptional work of art. One of the things that first attracted me to the photograph was its obvious link with this section from a late Ottoman era Egyptian mashrabiya in our collection. Continuing with the theme of Mashrabiya, Egyptian-born and Los Angeles-based Shirin Girgis here maintains her hallmark practice of using hand-cut hand -cut paper embedded with paint, gold powder, and gold leaf to depict the trio of windows, again emulating the window screens of old Cairo. In the large-scale sculpture at right, the carved wood Mashrabiya was likewise a source of inspiration for Girgis. These 1994 watercolors by Assad Arabi, long based in Paris, are concerned with the hidden world of his hometown of Damascus and with its, and with its contrasts and dualities such as those that exist between the exterior and interior of Damascene homes. For me, there's an obvious connection with our Damascus room, but Arabi's abstract rendering of the cityscape, though certainly tied to Western modernist tradition, 
also relates to the type of three-dimensional deconstructed architectural view, as in the pair of capitals from our 18th century room. Diazawi, like Asad Arabi, is an artist whose work spans the 1960s up to the present, establishing a dialogue between modern and contemporary. A pioneer of Iraqi modern art, Azawi is perhaps best known for his powerfully evocative work in the Tate in London massacre at Sabra and Shatila, depicting the slaughter of Palestinian refugees in southern Beirut in 1982. But our price range for now restricts us to the artist's prints. So for example, the untitled etching at left with its bound figure and dove relating to some of Azawi's later, larger scale works. The lithograph at right, with its abstracted image of a hawk has to do, according to the artist, with the transplanting of the Umayyad dynasty from Syria to Spain as reference to the poem quoted at right. The bird of prey also reminds us of the significance of falconry, a theme often repeated in Islamic art as in Lakma's Ottoman uh, album painting, which also helps to imply a comparable composition in Azawi's print and relates to these photographs by Tufik Behum which are part of a clever take on the, on the large photographs of emirs and sheikhs of the Gulf states whose oversized portraits are a common sight in most public buildings. Some juxtapositions between past and present are more obvious, as in the portrait of um, the contemporaneous portrait of Nasser Din Shah and Fatane Dadka's port, uh, photograph of a mural depicting the Shah, which has suffered equally from the ravages of time and from internal defacement, including graffiti. In its ruined state, the image of the mural has become a visual metaphor for the transformation of historical memory. Shoja Zari's video, Idyllic Life, takes as its starting point a 16th century Persian manuscript painting. Here, however, in the video version, the, ple the pleasant setting morphs into violent vignettes of grainy images of fervor and conflict. Like the painting, the story behind the video clips uh, are ambiguous, and the viewer is left to intuit the narrative of, of, Zari's, um, of Zari's dark and often disquieting vision. I would like to end with stills from this video by Sadiq al uh, from his The House uh, That My Father Built, which I first saw in Doha in 2010 in the wonderful exhibition Told, Untold, Retold. It was a unique edition, but I was so impressed by it that I gently harassed al dealer, also a friend, until we were able to acquire a slightly reduced size edition a few years later. I'm relentless, I have to say. Um, according to the artist who's based in the Netherlands, the work focuses on the home's reception room where his family often gathered. In spite of its Baghdad setting and intimately personal narrative, this highly emotional work reflects a universal experience, the setting aside of childhood and the relinquishment of parental security, in this case precipitated by the death of the artist's father. While it recreates a child's memories, perceptions, comforts, and anxieties through animation and memorabilia, for instance, pictures of the artist's parents and his father's clothes are hanging at the far left of the installation. It does something much more than that. It visualizes and, make, and makes tangible the artist's emotions as he seeks to accept the death of his father. The previously noted video, Measures of Distance by Mona Khatoum, similarly captures something universal. It's an intensely emotional, intimate, and physically palpable portrait of a mother-daughter relationship, undiminished by distance, but filled with longing. The inherent humanism in Alfraji and Khatoum's works is part of what, for me, constitutes great art. The ability to capture a collective human experience through images, words, and sounds. Given the times in which we live, the fact that the emotionalism of the Khatoum video is catalyzed through Arabic texts, while Afraji's poignant animation is projected onto a pair of photographs of his parents in their traditional Iraqi dress, may have added resonance for an American audience. For those who are willing to make the effort, such works are capable of helping the museum visitor to transcend the barriers of suspicion, prejudice, and xenophobia that oftentimes separates us. Thank you.